be online uh, during the time of the presentation. So I look forward to um, talk more. So that's my plan for today. So on the left is a nice illustration from Ichi's new book uh, showing the major carbon pools and the transferring among those pools. So I think it should be familiar to this community that um, all the processes listed there are um, influenced by not only extrinsic forcings such as climate and other environmental conditions, but also by intrinsic dynamics such as vegetation state, their acclimation, their technology. And on top of this complexity, um, I think it's fair to say that not only the current extrinsic forcing and intrinsic dynamics um, will have an impact, but also those conditions of the past. So for example, um, previous temperature and precipitation have a effect on GPP and soil respiration. And on the intrinsic side that we know previous growth and vegetation establishment will have an impact on subsequent growth. Of course, sometimes um, those factors get entangled and it's difficult to uh, disentangle to say which one is extrinsic and what is intrinsic. But it's fair to say that both aspects are happening. However, we often don't deal with the past effect explicitly. Instead, uh, we often implicitly assume that the chosen time scale for analysis is a adequate and appropriate one. So the first thing I'm going to uh, introduce you in this talk is a framework that explicitly quantify these past effects, which we also call antecedent effects. So um, this is Kiona Ogle's work, uh, and she calls it the stochastic antecedent modeling framework, the SAM framework. Um, so the central column here, you can see the response variable we're trying to understand. And for those who are familiar with the Bayesian graphic representations, you can see the data layer here, the process layer here, and the process parameter layer here. So to explain this central response variable, this form framework accounts for both extrinsic effects on the left-hand side and intrinsic ones on the right-hand side. By doing so, it also allows a operational definition of ecological memory, uh, which is consists of environmental memory, which is associated with antecedent exogenous um, effects due to extrinsic forcing, as well as biological memory, which is associated with the antecedent endogenous effect due to intrinsic dynamics. So together, they define ecological memory. And the nugget of the idea of this framework are the process parameters, Ws, which I will show you uh, closer in the next slide. So in the left, most diagram you can see x and is determined by x and uh, wx which is which is the antecedent environmental weights so in the equation x you can see is the environmental drivers at different times into the past and uh, w the antecedent weights are the relative importance at different times into the past so the so-called antecedent environment x and is really a weighted past environmental drivers. So to give you an example of a hypothetical antecedent weight shown here, on the x-axis, you have days into the past, zero being the present, and on the y-axis, you have the relative important weight. So um, in this hypothetical example, you have a bimodal pattern um, and present being uh, relatively important and the importance decreases over time until you have a secondary uh, importance around a week ago. So um, this, these uh, Ws are will parameters that will be estimated from data and each of them will be between 0 and 1 and they all sum up to 1. So in the Bayesian context, um, it's uh, fairly clear that you want to give it a Dirichlet prior. 
So now you are experts of the SAM framework. I'd like to show you a work that implements this idea uh, looking at memory of NEE. So I don't need to preach to the choir here about the importance of understanding and modeling NEE, which is the breathing of the carbon cycle and the daily and sub-daily NEE are really the building block of a lot of carbon cycle models. So we want to understand three questions. First of all, how important is memory for NEE dynamics? And secondly, over what time scales? And last but not least, what factors explain the variations in memory across sites? And when I say sites, obviously I'm using data from uh, different eddy covariance sites in this analysis. So we used daily NE and the micrometeorological data from the FluxNet dataset um, of 42 sites, and each site have more than five years of contiguous data. And overall, we have uh, over 400 site years. Uh, considered here. Some caveats to bear in mind, um, because we want more than five years of contiguous data, that does um, exclude some sites, so the tropics and boreals are very underrepresented here, although the overall the sites span the major bioclimatic and IGBP biome types. So we considered some short-term environmental covariates that includes uh, temperature, incoming radiation, VPD, um, current and past soil water content at daily time scales and up to two weeks previously. Um, and the reason for both current and past uh, soil water content is because with soil wetting, a wetting the um, carbon response can be very different depending on whether the soil was previously wet or dry. And we also consider a longer term covariate that's precipitation and it's implemented at varying uh, coarseness scale from weekly to seasonal. So these antecedent environmental covariates are used as their uh, min terms, their quadratic terms, and their pairwise interactions. Um, and the, the sensitivity uh, parameters that scales them are estimated from fitting the model to the data. And the implementation of these are um, nicely illustrated actually in John's paper. I think it's easier uh, to, to, to read than my own paper. And for the intrinsic side of the effect, we simplified things and just used the AR1 model on the residuals to capture the slow state change. Um, I want to ask any questions so far, but this is a recording, so hold your questions and I um, am happy to um, answer them. So together, um, you can consider NEE as the environmental effects, which includes not only the current environment, but also environmental memory um, and biological memory. So uh, those can be separated out by running different model experiments accounting or not accounting for uh, different types of memory. So some results. So on the y-axis, you have different bound types, evergreen forest, mixed forest, distributed forest, C3 and C4 grassland, and shrubland. And on the x-axis, you have the uh, total variation explained in r square terms. So when the model only accounts for current environments, um, which also includes a seasonal effect related to NDVI. You can see that um, about 80% of uh, variation in deciduous forest is explained as uh, in contrast to less than half of the variation explained in shrubland. When the model accounts for both current and past environments, and we look at the difference as environmental memory, you can see that's quite different for different biomes in general. So for temperate forest, it's rather small, 4% for the mixed forest here. And uh, it gets larger as we move into the hotter biomes. So um, especially for the C4 grassland, it accounts for 18% of the total variation. Finally, uh, biological memory accounts for roughly 
15% for many biomes. And unlike environmental memory, biological memory is much more similar across sites, across biomes. So taken together, what is clear is that memory effects when consider those environmental and biological memory together are clearly important for dry lands and perhaps not so much for, for example, deciduous forest in this particular data set. So if you're interested, I would encourage you to check out my uh, paper, which has a more detailed breakdown <clears throat> of the memory effects, not only for the overall bonds, but for each site. So what you can see is, although generally we can see memory is more important for grassland and shrubland, there's lots of variation across sites. Um, I would point out the different color scheme are used here. So dark blue is environmental memory and green is biological memory. So overall, we can say that AE remembers past environmental and biological conditions and therefore considering the memory effects in our experiments, in the observations that we do, and in the modeling and data simulation practices can be quite important for our understanding and our prediction. So over what time scale do your past conditions influence in you? Um, on the x-axis, you have days into the past, and on the y-axis, you have the cumulative importance. So the picture here is slightly more nuanced, but in general, you can see that the short and long-term moisture status are important. They're more variable. They have generally a wider spread um, in terms of cumulative importance, uh, which indicates longer uh, time scale of influence. And this type of diagnostic diagnosis can be uh, useful for generating new hypotheses that can motivate new experiments, observations, and model type. So what factors explain, in this case, environmental memory? On the x-axis, I have a aridity gradient from wetter to drier. And on the y-axis, the importance of import, uh, environmental memory. So what we found is that environmental memory scales with aridity both within and across biomes. So this convergence of response across biome types could indicate memory being an adaptive behavior to moisture availability, rather than memory being just governed by vegetation traits directly. Um, while being a important and tempting hypothesis, John's recent work has actually revealed more granularity in this statement. So I really encourage you to check out his poster if you still haven't. So to wrap this up, the SAM framework has been useful for revealing some patterns. And we also did some mechanistic kind of follow-up work, especially on C and its role in memory. But there's still huge gap or disconnect between our data and our conceptual understanding of that actually fully respect the, the complex adaptive nature of the biosphere. So for the next final two minutes, I'm going to just briefly show you some uh, current work that's been going on. So the first idea is the causal state modeling. So because a lot of memory work, uh, in a lot of memory work, the baseline response is often elusive. Um, so quite attracted to this idea of causal state, and I give you a reference at the bottom, um, which is a state space formally defining the baselines. And each causal state, they have the same distribution of fut possible futures and also contains the equivalent predictive information. So what's shown on the right hand side is a reconstructed dynamics or tractors of a French crop site. Um, it's NE and other variables. So on um, each point is a causal state and the projection from space of distributions. So tractors here really encodes how important information at the whole system level evolve through time. And because causal state models is the predictive, uh, the best predictive encoding, uh, which I don't have time to go into, uh, but I'll give you the reference here. Uh, it has a lot of nice properties that can be useful. 
So we did some preliminary work on um, quantifying the, the, on the x-axis randomness and on the y-axis the structure of observation versus some models. Finally, we're looking at memory in fluctuating lights to answer the question, is some memory anticipatory uh, to re get at the nature of memory? And to do this, we're doing some manipulative experiments on MPQ mutants, and which also involves some quite unconventional use of M fluorometer. So I want to close the talk by saying that uh, memory effects or complex temporal dynamic has been recognized as a fascinating phenomena for more than half a decade. Um, and I really hope my work can contribute to a better understanding of memory and temporal dynamics. And I quite look forward to discussing this topic further with the DA community. So, and I want to acknowledge my uh, collaborators in this various aspects and approaches that I use to study ecological memory. Thank you.